Hello everyone, this is Samir from Audio Science Review. Uh, true to our name, I have a review for you today, and that's this uh, GR Research uh, Little Giant Killer 2.0, LGK 2.0 kit speaker. Um, this was announced, I think, a couple months ago, and there was a fair bit of interest because of the naming uh, that, you know, despite being a small speaker, it uh, um, is able to compete or maybe beat even higher end products. The price, as you see, is depending on which capacitor you get. Um, it's between two hundred eighty-nine dollars and three hundred thirteen dollars, uh, and uh, you might think you get this speaker, but you do not. What you get is this uh, bag of parts. Uh, you get two drivers and uh, two filters. The uh, speaker uh, and this uh, driver. Uh, you can see it's a full range driver, so it's not a coaxial driver in that it's only got one binding post. So you feed it the full range sound and, you know, you, you get a speaker. Um, for reasons that the company explains, and I'll get into a little bit later, you'll, you still need some filtering uh, components, and, and that's what these parts here are for. Um, now, to to if... If you're not savvy with woodworking and good woodworking skills, because this is actually a complicated build due to support, you're going to need to uh, order what is called a flat pack. And a flat pack is uh, basically the um, <clears throat> parts you need, um, the, the wooden pieces, uh, the frame and, and already machine holes and everything to build the speaker. And uh, maybe this is a better look of it. Well, yeah, no. Um, on this thing so uh that costs you another hundred dollars so you go from you know if you get the fancier capacitor you go from 313 dollars to 413 dollars if you want a finished speaker as it looks um then that'll cost you over a thousand dollars so definitely not cheap a thousand dollars you have a choice of incredible set of speakers including some studio monitors and what have you so <clears throat> as a finished speaker it's just the roi is quite poor uh, on that as you'll see from the testing and review um, i requested a sample from a company uh, i tested another product from gr research uh, that actually did well but post review you know they and others complained that the build wasn't right and should have done this should have done that so i thought you know to avoid that kind of headache i, I see if they will send me a sample uh, that they build i only need one speaker so it's even lower cost and i'm actually happy to pay for it uh, but I wanted an official build from the company. Uh, you send them an email, and Danny uh, from GR Research, who's the company co owner or co founder, answered and uh, basically said no, uh, that uh, uh, he doesn't see any need for somebody like me testing his product. Um, I wrote back that, you know, I'm going to measure it properly and that. Uh, you know, I'll listen to it. And he wrote back that the uh, measurements that I make are no good because he's already provided his own measurements. And uh, the way I do listening tests is uh, what he called a bit of a joke and that I simply wasn't qualified to test his products. So I went ahead and uh, bought the kit and uh, gave it to my top DIY builder, Rick Sikora. Rick has been DIY speaker making forever, and he's built a bunch of other speakers for me for testing. He's extremely meticulous, and he really, really tries to replicate the design as it's meant. If he has issues, uh, he'll go back and actually ask questions and what have you. And the process is open in that he goes ahead and documents everything, and he posts this back in April. So plenty of time for people to look at and complain or raise issues, and none were raised. Uh, he's showing you a picture of the uh, components here that you get, sans the uh, driver. Um, this is the, uh, the driver, as I mentioned. Uh, you can see again that it only has one set of binding posts, so you give it a full range signal. Um, he pointed out that the uh, inductor quality was poor, um, and I fully agree. You can see how it's deformed. Uh, you basically want for a proper inductor, uh, all the layers need to be correctly wound on top of each other. This thing is not round, and the layers are just you know splitting away from each other. Um, I have one in here, but. I, I don't know that you can see it. Um, this is, uh, he picked a better one of the two for uh, um, for the uh, build. Uh, and I'm looking at this thing, it's got a flat thing in here and the sides are just not even. 
uh, it's, you know, for a $300 kit, I expect really high quality uh, uh, inductors in there. Um, as you can see, he actually went back and asked, you know, what the issue was. And they were, he was told that they were having uh, issues with suppliers. So maybe they opted for, you know, a lower quality supplier on this. But uh, it's unfortunate. Um, uh, the, uh, he, by the way, he measured it and he measured according to the specs. So, you know, as far as that's concerned, you know, the, the build is as designed. Uh, this is the flat pack. Uh, it's made out of MDF. And uh, this is why I talked about the difficulty of building this if you're a woodworker, if you're not a woodworker. Getting these dados in there and precisely and everything is non-trivial amount of work in here. Um, the uh, whoever's doing the the work in here has done an extremely good job on, on it, and this is all uh, cut out with a CNC machine. So once you get the uh, design right into the CAD program and the CAM program, uh, you can spit it out with very high accuracy and uh, really no complaints about this. Other than the fact that the edges are not rounded over, if I go back to this, you can see the edges here. Sorry, the mouse keeps moving. Uh, you see the edges in front baffle are rounded over. Unfortunately, the kit as it arrives, you can see it's got sharp edges and that causes diffraction. So uh, Rick had to actually get a router bit and, and uh, make a you know ra round over uh, around the corners. You can see in here the uh, original and then he had to uh, smooth the edges. And this is the complicated port structures, a little bit of a transmission line-ish kind of thing. And this is what causes a fair bit of difficulty in for you to be able to, you know, machine and, and do uh, cut this out yourself. Uh, if you're a decent woodworker, not a big deal. But anything beyond that, you know, you better get the, uh, um, you know, get the flat pack. And flat pack is $100, well worth it. Um, what you end up with is the this speaker over here, the little speaker. Let me get it for you. It's extremely dense and heavy, courtesy of of the uh, MDF. That's very, very thick for this class of speaker. This thing is not going anywhere. You can drive a tank over it, and nothing will flex. Now, whether you need such a stout enclosure for such a little driver with so little capability to pump out, you know, air, uh, it's to be debated. But certainly, uh, you know, it's over designed uh, from that point of view, and uh, the build is superb. Um, everything fit perfectly. It just, you know, Rick's done a fantastic job in here. So let's get into the review. Um, uh, you can see up here, I put the fact that it's a joke uh, to uh, as a line that uh, Danny gave me. Anyway, this is the speaker again. Uh, this is the backside. It uses these tube connectors that normally Danny has an upcharge of, I don't know, $50, $60 for. And uh, basically it's banana jacks without spring loading. And this time they were included. It's unusual. Usually that's an upcharge. You can see the tight, nice finish of this back panel is actually quite stiff. It doesn't even need the screws almost to hold it back. Um, you might think, well, this is an ultra small speaker and there's no competition. There's actually plenty of competition for small speakers. This is a Neumann uh, caged uh, AD DSP, one of the best uh, small speakers I've ever tested. Uh, it actually costs the same as uh, the GR Research LGK 2.0, uh, except that it also comes with amplifiers built in. It's an active two way and it's got ruler flat frequency response and uh, it's actually a little bit smaller. I do like small speakers for my desktop. And uh, so from that point of view, I appreciate the goal that uh, GR Research has in building a small one. So a lot of times studio monitors are just way too deep to uh, put on the desk or way too large. Anyway, uh, let's jump ahead and uh, look at the uh, measurements. Uh, the uh, overall frequency response is actually fairly flat. If you step back and ignore the little wiggliness in here, it's pretty good other than this peaking over here uh, at the end. Um, but this kind of little variations here and there, you know, exist in many speakers, uh, except for those active DSP ones that tend to correct for those things. But uh, I'll get into more of what these are. Now, if you go look at Danny's uh, announcement video, you'll see that he posts a frequency response. And unfortunately, or fortunately for him, it looks nothing like the one I'm showing you, right? So at first glance, you might say, whoa, the build is wrong and this can't be the, you know, this, you know, you haven't built it correctly. Well, 
if you look at the two clues in here, you'll see why his measurements are so different. For one thing, he's using a one-third octave smoothing. That means the high-resolution measurement was reduced, filtered tremendously down to only one-third of an octave uh, to get this graph. And what that does is that it gets smooths all these variations, all these vanish, because they're too, you know, when you average these things out, this becomes more or less a flat line. And the other thing is that this is what is called a gated measurement, which means that he doesn't have an anechoic chamber, nor does he has the, have the $100,000 measurement system I have for speaker measurements. So he's going to get reflections from his room. So he basically uh, has a uh, time value that says, all right, measure only for as long as it takes for the sound to reach the microphone and then stop. That eliminates the reflections in the room. But what it also does is that it severely uh, lowers the resolution of the measurement. So he's wise to not even show you anything below 200 hertz uh, because there's no resolution there. It's all smooth and, and bogus. And for this kind of measurement, uh, is actually probably not accurate even up to a few hundred hertz. So probably four or 500 hertz up to here. These are all way too smooth uh, on this thing. So if you, uh, Rick was kind enough to take my measurement and apply the same smoothing as, as his, and now you can see that they pretty much match uh, each other. And, uh, you know, same trough is in here. You're not going to get an exact measurement because his samples, Danny's samples, different than mine, and acoustic measurements are not that accurate, if you will. But you can see the overall shape is very much the same. So the build is matching that. Now, uh, Beyond using my expensive analog, uh, speaker measurement system for, uh, uh, you know, full uh, 3D uh, um, uh, dispersion of, of the speaker, I also put a microphone directly close to the drivers and a port and see what we get. And uh, we see that we have two components that generate sound, the port and the speaker itself. Here's the speaker response you can see over here. Uh, and it's a full range, so it keeps going. I'll show you later on what's causing these two things in here. But then we we'll also measure the port. The port is, as you can see, is providing bass enhancement. So where this thing would be rolling off, there's a resonance in there that causes this port to boost this, these frequencies up. And then what you hear is the sum of these two. So the speaker now goes from I don't know, 150 hertz uh, you know, response, now you can go down to 70, 80 hertz. So that's what ports do. But unfortunately, the other thing they do is that they let out whatever you don't want from inside of the enclosure out. In this case, the cabinet dimensions cause resonances inside. And uh, we can see that resonance where the port, ideal port should just do this and die off, but it actually gets a second life and starts to uh, generate a pretty loud resonance from internally. And then this gets summed with this and causes this kind of disturbance that you're seeing here. And this is unfortunate because this is a very critical area of, uh, for music and hearing is one to two or three kilohertz. Hearing is very sensitive, a lot of music contents in here. And this is what is, you know, you get mid-range coloration is called because of the ports. Almost every port causes this, but smart designers are able to suppress this a lot more or pull it further back so that where the woofer is much more dominant uh, on this thing, letting it come in here when the, you know, the response is getting lower and then this thing, you know, has a much better chance of competing with that and polluting that. Now, again, this is typical, so, you know, it just happens. Uh, I should say that padding material was not provided. Uh, but was recommended, and Rick did put the padding in there, and so without it, this may even be worse than worse than this. Okay, um, early reflections is uh, uh, basically the most important reflections that you're likely to hear beyond the direct sound, and ideally, it would look like this red line that I've drawn in here, and this more or less does that, except towards the end, all of a sudden, the response drops off. The response drops off is because this is acting like a, as an awfully large tweeter, and uh, because of this large size, it actually starts to beam. The high frequencies start to narrow, and that narrowing causes the uh, sound that goes off axis to be to have much less power. So, if your hearing is very good uh, and you go way up to 20 kilohertz, you'll find that if you then move your head left and right, you will lose some of that high frequency. So, generally, not a good thing to happen, but you know, it's not end of the world. 
we combine everything together and uh, we say, how would this sound in a typical room? And we see that it's actually quite reasonable. Other than this drop over here, uh, it's, it's reasonable. I can't complain about this being an issue uh, because I measure a lot of speakers, some are much worse than this. So overall, not a big problem. Um, this beam width um, uh, shows you the effect that I talked about. Notice that the, we have the, uh, the basically equal amount of energy up to about four or five kilohertz. Then after that, the, the driver, what I, we call beaming, it starts to become like a flashlight and narrows down. And that was the effect that I talked about. And it follows this precise logarithmic curve in here. So uh, when you do a log scale in here, it becomes a flat line and you can see the, you know, follows the physics that mandates that happens. So there it is. And you can see it pictorially better in here with a uh, colorful uh, measurement here. By the way, I plan to do a much more deeper dive video on how to read these graphs and how speaker measurements work. So for now, just focus on high level message that this thing becomes very directional at very high frequencies. The real issue manifests itself in distortion measurements. I usually measure speakers at 86 dB and 96 dB. Uh, little smart speakers and things can't handle 96, so uh, go down. Uh, in this case, as at 86, it already the situation was quite dire with the speaker. You can see that we're off the scale. My scale goes up to 5%, and now, usually you expect it to do that at very low frequencies, but here we're seeing that even at 500, 400 hertz, we're already off the scale. And uh, if I change the scale from 5% to 100%, we can see that we basically have 100% distortion uh, over here. And even here, like two or 300 hertz, we have 10% distortion. The problem with that distortion is that they've got harmonics that spray in here at higher frequencies, and they then interfere with the region uh, that where our hearing is quite sensitive. Uh, we're not sensitive here, but we are sensitive to what happens here. And this can have audible effects. Uh, but these things are not directional, they're directional information, these THD measurements. They're not psychoacoustically accurate, unless you apply the explanation I just gave. And uh, the ultimate test of this actually is listening test. Uh, you might think that we're all about measurements. No, there's a reason I listen to every speaker, because distortion is something you can assess pretty easily with your ear. Well if you have good, good hearing. So let me move on. If I plot the uh, distortion at, uh, uh, as an absolute value rather than percentage, and I went from 86 to 90 dB, at 90 dB, the driver was already starting to crackle at some frequencies, so I didn't dare go on above 90 dB. But even at 86 dB, I draw this 50 dB line where I like to see everything below that, and we already see that in this region, we're already way above it. Uh, again, we can ignore the low frequency ones. And here it gets very close to the threshold. At 90 dB, it's already way above. I mean, this is just unusable and on this thing. I uh, also made the impedance measurements and phase measurements. And uh, uh, my measurements here are extremely high resolution and accurate. So as a result, it shows very minute detail that you don't normally see in this kind of measurements because normally you don't care about very fine variations. Uh, another reviewer that was in the thread complained that the build must be wrong because he, he's never seen this. Well, you know, if you set up a very high resolution uh, impedance measurements, which requires about half a dozen parameters being set right, um, you do get this, and I've seen it in other speakers as well. Um, good news here is that Danny tries to keep the impedance high, which means that it's easier on amplifiers, you don't need as much current, and he's achieved that with a six ohm uh, uh, minimum impedance in here, you can see it over here. So good job there on that. Uh, I'm not too worried about this right now. Um, waterfall display, uh, this is a good teaching moment on this graph. Uh, if I run this thing the way I normally run it, uh, basically this is frequency response over time. So the top line is basically what you saw earlier, but then we keep scanning uh, uh, numerically, not physically, <laughs> numerically when we're able to find these extensions in here, which means that when a t uh, note plays in here, it actually hangs in the air and it keeps takes a while to die. Uh, an ideal speaker would just have this being flat. And uh, every one of these things is, is a, what we call resonance, which means that the thing plays its own tune after you stop. Um, 
you look at this, uh, just as the frequency response test indicated, all of a sudden you say, well, that doesn't look anything like Danny's thing because Danny's one, you know, it looks like this basically shows almost no resonances. There's one in here, it shows, and maybe tiny one here, but it's all clean and he raves about how clean it is. But look, I can get exactly the measurement that he has, just the same. How did I do that? I just changed one number in the settings for this graph, which was to move the noise, uh, the floor of this measurement uh, just 4 dB higher. So what it did was that it all of a sudden sliced off all of these low amplitude resonances. So if you just bring the floor, the carpet up, then all of the wiggliness becomes below it and it disappears. This is the reason I, I warn people to not fall in love with this waterfall display. It is so easy to lie with this graph and show extremely good performance, or I could actually go the other way and show millions of resonances in here. It's a judgment call of what you pick. Um, best use of this, this kind of measurement is actually for design usage when you're not trying to lie to yourself or somebody else, and uh, you're searching for problems. And in general, it doesn't tell you anything useful anyway, because these resonances are caused by these peaks over here. And you can see every time I have a peak in here, I have a corresponding uh, uh, you know, time uh, ringing. So the frequency response already told you that. Look at this peak over here, and you can see that it extends in time as well. So by just looking at the frequency response, you can tell where the resonances are. You don't need this fancy display that can lie to you this way. And indeed, we look at his display, all of these are resonances in here, yet he shows no lingering uh, tones. Why? Because he has just 25 dB of dynamic range in here. His floor is way up, and so therefore his measurement's not sensitive enough to show that. Anyway, a uh, step over the uh, step response. Um, post a review uh, that I post uh, in writing a week ago. I made an electrical uh, measurement of the network that's in there. I um, put a probe around the speaker terminals and ran a sweep. And we can see basically the, uh, what the two, what the uh, filter components are doing. First one is what's called the baffle step compensation, which he talks about in his video, Danny does. And uh, that's basically an amplitude rise at certain frequencies that get to be the size of the uh, uh, front of the speaker. And so you need that, otherwise you get a boost in that region. And the second one is this notch filter that is put in there. Why is the notch filter put in there? If you look at the, the measurements of the driver itself, which uh, uh, GR researchers post, you can see that the response gets screwy over here. You have uh, some loss of energy in here, then it got some peaking. Uh, looks like he's attempting to bring this part of it down. The problem with that is that it's got a very narrow notch and there are part variations uh, out there where you can't time or you know match this against such a weird shape of stuff. With active DSP or software DSP, you could have corrected all of this. Uh, it would still take fair number of filters. And the problem with passive components is that every filter costs you a good bit of money because you've got expensive components. Software DSP is free. Uh, Danny doesn't believe in software DSP, which is a shame because it's extremely powerful too. Anyway, he attempted to correct for this, but it didn't correct because if we go back, sorry about scrolling on you, um, we can see that this whole peak is in here and this glitch in here. So that notch filter might as well not be there. It's also too narrow to be perceptually uh, audible or hearing uh, the bandwidth gets, uh, resolution of it gets quite poor at very high frequencies. So, you know, you could have a broad filter for all of this where you just flatten this whole hump and it would be the, much better than trying to put a notch filter in there and incur so much cost in, in parts. Okay, so uh, those are the measurements, but the punchline actually in this case is not measurements. I listen to every speaker and the top thing I listen for is distortion because as I mentioned, distortion measurements are directional but your ear, if they're trained and you know what to look for, you have the right material, you have the right setup, you can actually you know, hear and, and verify that what the problem is. And uh, based on tonality, I expected the speaker to sound good. Uh, the distortion was worrying me, but I wasn't sure at what point it was gonna uh, kick in. So I played a track and at the beginning it was okay and quickly the sound became garbled and it got garbled in vocals, but in a special situation. And uh, 
uh, after I did the review, people said, can you post some samples? Well, here's a bonus for you. I went ahead and uh, uh, set up my Earthworks uh, measurement microphone, put it in front of the driver. I use a, a RME Babyface um, uh, ADC and a microphone amp to uh, capture that. And you get to listen to that. You hear exactly what I heard. So let's do that. Once our romance was a gay thing Now I am only your plaything I know it's all unfair But I'm too much in love to care With every kiss you deceive me Sooner or later you'll leave me so here I started very low volume. At the beginning, the volume is just too low to listen to other than maybe background music. And so what I was doing, I was gradually increasing the volume and you can, s hopefully you heard about a third in, the, uh, in there, uh, you already started to hear her vocals started to tremble. And from then on, it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And towards the end, before it got really way too loud, it started, the driver started to crackle. But well before that, you already had that problem. Let me play it again for you. Once our romance was a gay thing. Now I am only your plaything. I know it's all unfair. But I'm too much in love to care. With every kiss you deceive me. Sooner or later you'll leave me. So... Then you skip to another track and this problem won't be there. What is it, in, uh, why is it here and <laughs> not on some other tracks? What is happening here, there's a set of drums that are playing and then she sings over them. The drums cause large excursions on this little driver, forcing it to get severely distorted. And then the highs are riding on top of that and you're getting into modulation distortion. And that's what's causing the vocals to distort also because a driver is way non-linear already and it's operating in a bad uh, uh, region. Now, if this was a woofer and you had a separate tweeter, a two-way speaker, that wouldn't happen because the tweeter is not impacted by the distortion of the woofer. But when you take a single driver and have it play full range, then you buy the distortion at low end that impacts the, the higher frequencies. So to me, this was totally, totally unlistenable speaker. Uh, and by the way, listening setup was just like you see it here, a little bit past an arm's length. And this is where I test a lot of the near field speakers. I also put them on my desk over here. But the nice thing about this setup is that there's no desk in here. So avoid the uh, bounce from the desk. And uh, uh, I've tested a ton of speakers in here. None have ever, ever, ever distorted at low volumes like this. Um, and the problem with distortion is that it's a learned skill. Once you hear this distortion, as you just heard, and you turn the volume down, even when you get to the minimum volume, you can still hear the distortion now because your ear track got trained. Now it knows what the distortion sounds like and uh, uh, it refuses to not hear. And uh, so this was a problem. So what I did was to verify this was that I put an extremely sharp filter in there to chop off everything below 80 hertz, I think I put in there, yeah, 80 hertz. And once I did that, wow, all of a sudden you could get Decent sound. Was it still distorted at high sound levels? Yes, it still couldn't get loud enough, uh, but it definitely proved that you can't allow the speak, this little tiny driver to play bass. It severely distorts. It's not made to be pushed like this to do this, and it just sounds horrid. Uh, you know, tonality, you could get used to it. You can use software EQ to correct it. And here, by the way, I did fix the tonality a little bit. These two filters did subtly improve the sound once you had this in here. But overall, actually, I don't have complaints about tonality. Um, you know, it, it has flat enough response that that's not the issue. But to the extent, you know, it's just so distorted, it's an unusable design. Um, one of the reasons, by the way, it's so easy to hear the problems is because I follow the research which is says use one speaker to do this kind of testing. Um, Danny ridiculed me for this, but 
this shows the power of research and why you should do it this way. If you play this with two speakers, uh, first what the left channel's playing and what the right play channel's playing, they could mask distortions in the other one. Um, and secondly, your mind starts to focus on things like imaging and where the instruments are and everything, and you get blinded by that effect, and you don't pay attention to fundamental issues of, of the speaker. The research shows that as you increase the number of cha uh, channels in a playback system, listeners get less and less critical about faults of the speakers. Indeed, in a 5.1 setup, good and bad speakers are rated more or less the same uh, on this thing. So this is why it's important to test a single speaker. The sound of a single speaker doesn't change when you add a second one. It's still doing the same thing. You want to know if the design is fundamentally sound. And unfortunately, this design is not fundamentally sound. For uh, something that if you bought the finished one for $1,100, it, it just makes no sense. I, this exp uh, in my humble opinion, <laughs> this speaker should not exist as a product in the marketplace because it's just a distortion factory. It doesn't play at any volume, anything decent. I, I, I don't know what it's about. I mean, this driver is the same size as what's in my headphone. <laughs> you know, it's not made to be pulled down to 80 hertz and try to produce that. It just, this is something I'm sure it gets sold to put in boom boxes or maybe smart speakers, which by the way, almost always have DSP and correction and limiters in there to make sure it doesn't attempt to be overdriven in good designs. Trying to put it naked in there without a limiter, without proper EQ. It just asking for trouble uh you know the world of speaker making is not stupid it's so much cheaper to build a speaker with a single driver than this to make a two-way speaker why isn't the world producing speakers that look like this they don't because it's not workable you know this is the size of a mid-range driver in a you know three-way speaker is there's reason we need a woofer in there and a twitter and a crossover and everything else uh now if somebody wants to try it produce a good one yes do it but this design is not it. Um, I'm at a loss why Danny didn't hear all these distortions. Um, uh, you know, maybe that's the reason he didn't want to give me this sample. I don't know. Uh, but I really, really am disappointed that he would put the speaker in the market and rave about not only is it a great speaker in its own weight class, but it actually goes way above his weight class and, and outperforms things at much higher price. Uh, I'd much rather have, a, you know, a Amazon Echo playing music than, than this thing or Sonos or something else. Uh, this, again, uh, in my opinion, measurements show it. My listening tests show it. You now heard it. Uh, it's, it just doesn't sound good. By the way, I waited a week to do this testing because I worried that maybe something had gone wrong with the uh, driver during my testing. Uh, measurements showed that the frequency was everything else as I showed were correct, but I still wanted to be sure. So uh, I had Rick send me the second driver and I swapped them. So what's in there right now is a new one and that's what you heard. And that one was never tested uh, until I put it in there on the exact same problem uh, as this one. I measured a DC resistance. One of them is 5.3 ohm, the other one's 5 ohms. So very strange that they're, they're not even, you know, that accurate as far as the DC resistance of these things. So I've ruled this out. Could something else be wrong with this build? Who knows? But, you know, I tried. I asked him for a sample. Danny would just, just was insulting and would not cooperate. So I'm out five or $600 of my own money with something that has unfortunately no value and I'm sure nobody wants to buy it from me. If you think it's the greatest speaker, please, please come and, <laughs> and buy it from me. I'm happy to sell it to you for half the price and you can play with it. Okay, hopefully uh, you got something out of this review and uh, saved you from making a mistake and potentially buying the speaker. Okay, see you in a future video. Bye-bye.